Hare Krishna devotees. Oh, Hare Krishna devotees, <clears throat> how wonderful to be with you <clears throat> celebrating this most wonderful month of Kartik. And today we're focusing on Srimad Bhagavatam 10th Canto, chapters 9 and 10, <clears throat> which are covering the whole of the Dhammada Leela. The two parts, of course, in the Dhammada Leela. One is the actual, the actual Dhammada, uh, Lord Krishna being tied, uh, and then that that's chapter nine, and then chapter ten is describing the deliverance of Nalakuvra and Manigriva. So it's part that they're, they're both parts of two parts of the same pastime, but they're a little, <clears throat> little separate from each other. So it's just most wonderful pastime, absolutely. You know, this pastime took place on the Diwali day. So you can bear that in mind. Diwali, um, well, I don't know. Maybe it depends where you are, <clears throat> but where I am, Diwali is on the 4th of November, the day before Govardhan Puja. So you can remember on that day, that on the Diwali day, <clears throat> that this is when the Dhammada Leela actually took place, in fact. So yes, it's described very beautifully in the 10th canto, in the ninth chapter, with wonderful purports by Srila Prabhupada, one of the very last parts of uh, Srimad Bhagavatam, which Srila Prabhupada tra translated and commented on. Uh, so let, let's just run through the pastime. <clears throat> so on that, uh, on that day, in that morning, uh, Krishna was Krishna was sleeping, just having a nap, a short nap. Srila Prabhupada would call a short nap a snap. So Krishna was having a snap, and Mother Yashoda was churning yogurt into butter in in a fairly big clay pot one of these uh, uh, single-use clay pots. Uh, so probably, I don't know really, but <laughs> I would imagine maybe 15 liters or maybe 20 perhaps, but at least I'd say around 15 liters of yogurt she was churning into butter. That traditional type of butter is different from the commercial butter, which I think most of us use these days. The commercial butter is made from cream. It's very rich, uh, even a bit too rich, really, and fatty. But that uh, the butter made from yogurt, it's white. Cream butter, it's pale, but it goes yellow very quickly. And the, yogurt, the, the butter made from yogurt is much more healthy, less fatty. So she was churning away. And then, uh, there, well, there's very beautiful description in, in the ninth chapter of the 10th canto, how she was churning and singing uh, songs of her own creation, 
about uh, Krishna's pastimes and how wonderful Krishna is. And Mother Yashoda, of course, at that point, uh, she is a middle-aged woman. Srila Prabhupada made the point that Nanda Maharaj and Mother Yashoda, when Lord Krishna uh, was born to them, when Lord Krishna appeared, they were already in their 40s, early 40s. So they're middle-aged, and Mother Yashoda was kind of somewhat heavily built, but of course very beautiful, very devotional. And as she was churning and singing about Krishna, then some milk was coming from her breasts in that motherly mood. So this was going on, and she, Mother Yashoda, <clears throat> extremely important point is that she was she was really worried about Krishna because Krishna, uh, even though he's only three, Krishna is three at this point, three years old. Diwali day, a couple of months after Janmashtami, of course, and just a few days before the Gopastami day, and there's the description there of the Gopastami, that Krishna was three, that, that was when he first started herding the calves, first time on the Gopastami day when he was three. But Mother Yashoda was in great anxiety about her son, about Krishna, because he was developing a stealing habit. At this point, Krishna has already got the name Makan Chor. Makan meaning butter and Chor meaning thief, the butter thief. And Mother Yashoda was so concerned that she selected the best of Nanda Maharaja's cows and uh, ke- she cut grass for them. The best grass in Vrajmandala, she cut by hand herself and fed it to the cows, those seven or eight or nine cows, best. And then she personally milked them. And then she turned the milk or some of the milk into yogurt. And then she would churn the yogurt into butter. And then every day, however many kilos of butter, maybe she she would make 10 kilos of butter or something like that. And she'd just give it to Krishna. Here, just take it. The best butter, just the very best. So Krishna would take it all and start eating. Mother Yashoda would go back to her household chores. She'd come back in five minutes to find out how Krishna's doing. And Krishna has gone already. He's next door stealing butter. Not because Krishna is some sort of butter fanatic like, you know, someone is maybe a samosa fanatic or a burfi fanatic or... They just like eating a certain type of food stuff just for the taste. But Krishna likes to taste the love of his devotees. And all the cows and all the ladies of Raja, their love would go into the dairy products and particularly the butter. And Krishna wanted to taste their love, so he'd take the butter. He'd steal it because they couldn't give it to him. If they gave it to him, then their husbands would have been very upset. So, okay, so Mother Yashoda's churning away, Krishna's asleep. Then uh, Krishna woke up, and there's a nice description from Srila Jiva Goswami in Gopal Champu. 
the ocean of beauty woke up and immediately began crying. Getting up, he went to his mother. He appeared to his mother and others as follows, as described now, breathing heavily, rubbing his limbs, rubbing his eyes. He cried, mother, mother. Hearing the sound of churning, he walked, stumbling to his mother. So, yes, so he, he caught hold of the churning rod to stop her from churning because he wanted to be breastfed by her. So she immediately started breastfeeding him and... Uh, well, here, listen to this. When, when Krishna approached her and, and insisted on being breastfed, Jiva Goswami says, the milk flowed from Yashoda like glistening monsoon rains. Krishna was like an eager chatak bird drinking those showers. So, so Krishna is now being breastfed. <clears throat> Mother Yashoda is continuing the churning. And then, as I think most or all of you are aware, inside the house, here they're kind of outside, more or less in the courtyard. But inside, she saw a pot of milk was boiling over. And this milk was for Krishna. So Mother Yashoda, um, she put Krishna down. Actually, according to Jiva Goswami, she told him, I worship you with Ar Arti, but for a moment, please protect the churning pot. After taking care of the milk, I'll come back as quickly as I can. She told Krishna that when she went off. Now, <clears throat> of course, the question can arise, why did she leave Krishna, this direct service of breastfeeding Krishna, and go to save the milk? Well, the answer to that can be understood from a famous verse which Prabhupada quotes on a number of occasions. It's spoken by Lord Shiva to Durga. Um, Aradhananam Saravesham, Vishnur Aradhanam Param, Tasmat Paraturam Devi, Tadiyanam Samarchanam. That of all types of worship, worship of Lord Vishnu or Lord Krishna is the best. But even higher than the worship of Krishna is the worship of Tadiya, the paraphernalia used in the service of Krishna, which includes the devotees. It includes the devotees, but it includes the paraphernalia, the different things <coughs> used in Krishna's service, like in this case, the milk. Yeah. So, therefore, it's said, since the milk and yogurt were for Krishna, they were even more attractive than Krishna. This is Jiva Goswami. This is why Mother Yashoda decided to leave Krishna and go for the paraphernalia, the milk. Because the paraphernalia is more dear to Krishna, more attractive than Krishna. Yeah. That's also Jiva Goswami. So, so now there she is, saving the milk, and Krishna, despite her explaining to him what she's going to do, Krishna becomes angry. And, you know, it's a bit of a long story, but basically the first thing Krishna did in his anger was break a hole in that, that churning pot, big clay pot, that she was churning 10 or maybe 15 liters of yogurt 
into butter in. Krishna broke a hole in it, <clears throat> and out came half-formed butter and yogurt and some of its buttermilk, and it's a whole mixture and a whole mess, and many liters. Then Krishna climbed up, and there were some pots of different dairy products and things suspended from the ceiling. Krishna broke them. And, and the contents all fell out on the ground. So, talk about a housewife's nightmare. It was really amazing. And Bhagavatam describes how Krishna, he took, took some of the butter in the sort of the middle of all of this happening. He took some of the butter, went to a, <clears throat> a quiet little spot out of the way, ate some butter, and cried. He was upset with Mother Yashoda. An interesting little philosophical point which comes up is that some people think that Krishna, like in the case of his relationship with Mother Yashoda, that Krishna's just acting like he's her son. Krishna's thinking, well, well, she's a nice devotee. She thinks I'm her son. So I'll act like I'm her son. But, but I'm not her son. I'm God. But I'll act like I'm her son just to sort of pacify her. Some people think like that. But actually, Njiva Goswami again explains that if Krishna was just acting, then in this situation, where he's gone off to some quiet spot around, just out of the way. Nobody's there at all. Why would he be crying if he's acting? There's no one for him to act to. So Krishna is actually feeling like that. He's totally absorbed in the pastime. And he's not thinking that I'm just like a dramatic actor, just making it seem like I think I'm her son. He feels like that. So anyway, yeah, long story. He came back out and started eating some of the butter, but then he started feeding the monkeys butter until the monkeys had had enough butter. Just at that point, just at that point, uh, Mother Yashoda, Mother Yashoda came out from having saved the milk and, and doing whatever she may have been doing for some minutes inside the kitchen. She came out, and as she came out, a voice from the sky spoke. The baby bee, being very thirsty, has not been fully satisfied with honey and has thus broken the lotus bud. On breaking the lotus and seeing only the contents flow out without honey, the bee has gone to another lotus and obtained honey. This is a voice from the sky speaking in sort of physical, figurative, metaphorical terms about what's happened with Krishna. Moreover, you've shown skill in taking the milk off the fire, but you will be praised more for your ability to pacify the anger of your son. <laughs> okay, so she tried to sneak up on Krishna, but there's a saying that a thief has a hundred eyes, whereas the owner of wealth has only two. <laughs> so Krishna saw her coming. And Krishna, just to sort of, you could say, irritate her further, Krishna said, he's, he's offering the butter to the monkeys. The monkeys are refusing. And Krishna, just to irritate her, says, Mata Jassi, your butter is so bad, 
Even the monkeys won't eat it. <laughs> and then Mother Yashoda felt, that's it. I've got to help this boy become a proper person. Otherwise, he's going to grow up bad. Now he's stealing butter. In the future, he may steal buffalo carts. He may become like a serious criminal. He may become the head <clears throat> of the Makan Mafia. And people will wonder, what sort of mother did he have? Useless mother couldn't train him properly. So she decided, okay, I will catch him. I will catch him. So now there's a big chase scene. Mother showed a heavily built middle-aged woman chasing after little three-year-old, very agile little Krishna who's dodging this way and that, very easily escaping her. And uh, yes, her mood of motherly concern that I've got to train this boy. I have to help this boy become a, a proper person. Otherwise, he's going to grow up to be some sort of social misfit, some sort of delinquent. i got to train him. I've got to help him. That mood of hers increased and increased until it just overflowed. And when it overflowed, then it overflowed on top of Krishna. And Krishna couldn't stop her from catching him. So she caught him. Now, next thing, I mean, there are many things. <clears throat> you know, I've, I'm doing a seminar on this pastime. We have already finished eight hours. And we have just got to the point where she's tied Krishna. So here we're just sort of racing through. But then uh, Mother Yashoda, tells Krishna, well, let, let me just read a Bhagavatam verse here. This is 10th Canto, chapter 9, verse 11. When caught by Mother Yashoda, Krishna became more and more afraid and admitted to being an offender. As she looked upon him, she, she saw that he was crying, his tears mixing with the black ointment around his eyes. And as he rubbed his eyes with his hands, he smeared the ointment all over his face. Mother Yashoda, catching her beautiful son by the hand, mildly began to chastise him. So she scolded him a bit. Uh, and then she wanted to tie him up. So the description is, she took some string from her hair. And then she took a second piece of its silk string from her hair and she put it around Krishna and around a grinding mortar, <laughs> a wooden grinding mortar, which just happened to be nearby in the courtyard. But you know what she found, don't you? The string was two fingers too short. And she was surprised because she thought, it must be enough. You know, he's just a little boy and the, the grinding mortar is not so big. So she got some rope, churning rope, and ladies from the village, they brought some rope. But it was still two fingers too short. And she was adding rope and rope. Now there's five meters, maybe 10 meters. And you know, if 10 meters of rope won't go around your stomach and, and around a grinding mortar, you devotees, you've been eating too much prasadam. That's a fact. But all the time, there's too much, there's, it's two fingers too short. 
but she's just carrying on and she's not really thinking, wait a minute, this is not possible. Something's wrong here. She just kept adding rope until again that mood of hers of motherly concern to help her son become a better person. It just overflowed again. And it overflowed over Krishna. And then he couldn't stop her from tying him. And then the rope became enough. And those two silk strings from her hair was enough for tying Krishna to the grinding mortar. So then she went off to, to do some household duties. Krishna's tied to the grinding mortar. And you know the story. Krishna then, crawling, began dragging this heavy, solid wood, grinding mortar along the ground. Uh, it became caught between two Arjuna trees. Krishna crawled between them. The grinding mortar got stuck against both of them. He kept crawling and down came those two Arjuna trees, crashing down and, and causing a whole disturbance in the village. So, yeah, Arjuna trees, an interesting point. Listen to this. Arjuna trees, they have very heavy root systems. Therefore, they are used in some places as windbreaks to protect crops. They put the, the Arjuna trees around the fields <laughs> where they're trying to grow whatever they're trying to grow. In places like Mauritius, there's a lot of Arjuna trees because there they get cyclones and hurricanes almost every year, which destroy the crops. So they brought Arjuna trees from India because an Arjuna tree cannot be blown down even by a hurricane. But devotees, listen to this. Our Krishna, our Krishna is so strong, he knocked over two of them. Oh, Krishna, he's very powerful. So then, uh, when, when, when that has happened, then the Bhagavatam, describes the story of Nalakuvara and Manigriva from those two trees, which are now just, they've crashed to the ground. Out of those trees, out of one came Nalakuvara, out of the other one came Manigriva, and they're like young demigods, and they offer prayers to Krishna. So, <clears throat> then there's a description of how it is that those two demi young demigods ended up uh, becoming embodied as trees, getting the bodies of these trees and just standing there for a long time. So that's a famous story. Uh, they were the two sons of Kuvera who's the, the treasurer of the demigods, like the bank manager for the demigods, and he's very wealthy and very influential and famous and admired. So these two, his sons, they got carried away by their fame and their wealth, their prestige, and they just became degraded sense gratifiers, actually. So one day, Narada Muni was coming to visit Kuvera, and he's walking in through the, the grounds, approaching the 
Ellis <coughs> of uh, Cuvera. Very beautiful, beautiful situation. And then he sees on one side, there's a lake. Just by the road, he's like the driveway, you could say, heading into the palace. And in that lake, there's Nulla Kuvra and Mani Griva, uh, completely naked and drinking liquor and shouting and laughing like low-class drunkards. And there are also some young ladies there who are they're having some exchanges with, some pastimes with, and those young ladies were also naked. So, but when the young ladies saw, here comes Narada Muni, great saintly person, they immediately hid themselves and covered themselves out of embarrassment. But not Nalakuvra and Manikriva. They just carried, carried on laughing and joking and just making fools of themselves while drinking more liquor. So Narada saw this and Narada uh, considered how can I help them? They're, they're from such a good family, sons of one of the main demigods, but they've become like malechas, just like purusha pashu, man animals practically, low class. Well, even the animals don't drink liquor. So I got to help them come to their senses, but how to do it? And Narada considered that the best thing he could do was to, to really teach them a lesson and straighten them out, uh, was to put them into the form, curse them, so they took the form of trees. Then they can stand naked 24 by 7 for years and years and hundreds of years even. And, and in the summer they'll be hot, in the winter they'll be cold, and when it rains they'll get wet and it'll just be such an existence. And they'll understand that we've got to pull ourselves together and get out of this. So he thought, this is the, the logic that he thought. He thought that among all types of maya, riches, money, bewilders one the most. More than beauty, birth, or learning, or fame, if one has riches too much and one becomes carried away by them, then uh, one fa falls down into all types of degradation, including animal killing. So he thought to himself, whose body is it actually? Is it the, you know, like a person, is it their parents' body? They give birth to the body. They look after the body through childhood. Uh, is it the teacher's body at school? Is it the employer's body uh, when, when a person leaves school and starts working? Is it, is it the uh, husband or wife's body when, when you get married? Is it your children's body when you have to dedicate your life to looking after them? And at the end, is it the body of the fire? or of the animals who may eat the body. Whose body is it? And Narada thought to himself that it's so obvious that it is not just our body just to enjoy as we like. It's so obvious. Narada says, if someone cannot recognize that it's not my body, then Narada says, he must be a rascal. <laughs> a devious person, if they can't see that. 
So therefore he cursed them. Uh, and he said, someone who's poor automatically gains the results of performing austerities and penances just by having nothing and living with nothing. Saintly people can easily associate with poor people, but not with rich people. So they should be placed in poverty. And then finally he decided, let them be, become trees. He cursed them to become trees for 100 years of the demigods. Wow. After which he said, Krishna will deliver them, which is what happened right now. So, uh, so they came out, they offered prayers, very nice prayers. This is the end of their prayers from the Bhagavatam. Henceforward, may all our words describe your pastimes. May our ears engage in oral reception of your glories. May our hands, legs, and other senses engage in actions pleasing to you. And may our minds always think of your lotus feet. May our heads offer our obeisances to everything within this world because all things are also your different forms. And may our eyes see the forms of Vaishnavs who are non-different from you. So Krishna, he, he, uh, he blessed them. O oh, Nalakuvara, money griever, you can return home. You can be absorbed in my devotional service. Your desire to develop love and affection for me will be fulfilled, and now you will never fall from that platform. So with that blessing, Krishna sent them back to the heavenly planets to finish their lifetimes as demigods, as, anyway, as demigods, and then to go back to him, back to Godhead. So, uh, you know, this is in a nutshell, and I mean a very small nutshell, <laughs> This is the story of uh, chapter 9 and chapter 10 of the 10th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. Uh, there's something else I want to touch on, um, which is from Gopal Champu of Srila Jiva Goswami. And this, this is deep. Gopal Champu is... Srila Jiva Goswami's description of the uh, pastimes of Vrindavan. Well, not just Vrindavan, but Krishna's pastimes as described in the Bhagavatam, but with more detail and different considerations and so on. It's a big book. And the book, the format is that two devotees, Madhukanta and Snigdakanta, they come into the court of Nanda Maharaj and they want to recite the glories of Krishna. So, so that's Gopal Champu. It's Madhukanta and Snigdakanta just reciting these pastimes, all the pastimes from Krishna's appearance right through right through in, in tremendous detail, these two. They're reciting and reciting, and Nanda Maharaj and all the bridge buses, they're just entranced completely, and they're just in ecstasy, and they're glorifying Madhukanta and Snigdakanta as they're reciting and reciting and reciting, for days and days and days they're reciting. So at the end of this pastime, Nanda Maharaj says 
two Snigda Kanta. These are two brothers. Madhu Kanta means sweet throated or three sweet voiced. And Snigda Kanta basically means affectionate, a throat or affectionate, loving voice. So Nanda Maharaj says to Snigda Kanta, where did those two go? Means Nalakuvra and Mani Griva. Where are they now? Where are they now? Please explain. So, bowing his lotus face, Snigda Kanta became silent. From the corners of his eyes, he glanced at his brother, Madhu Kanta. <laughs> and Nanda Maharaj said, why do you hesitate? Why do you not speak? And Snigda Kanta says, my Lord, Nanda Maharaj, what can I say? You know the story. So then, uh, Nanda, Maharaj, Nanda Maharaj says, please tell the story with your own mouth. That will please us. So who, what happened to, to Nalakuvra Manigriva? Where did they go? Where are they now? What's their situation? Snigdakanta said, those two persons attained the mercy of Narada. And then he said, we are the two. To whom <coughs> Narada gave great results by his mercy. So actually, Snigdakanta and Madhukanta who tell the, the whole story, incredible story of Gopal Champu, Snigda Kanta, Madhu Kanta, there, Nalakuvra and Mani Griva. So I just want to conclude here. We have a minute or a couple of minutes or whatever. Bye. Uh, this is now at the end, after everything, after the whole thing is finished, even, even a couple of days after, maybe, Nanda Maharaj comes and uh, asks, where, where is Yashoda? And her assistants say, she hasn't eaten all day. She's not speaking to anyone. And uh, so Nanda Maharaj says to Krishna, because Mother Yashoda is very upset about this whole episode. It's just been too much for her. So Nanda Maharaj says to Krishna, will you go to your mother? Krishna said, no. No, I'll spend my time with you. Then uh, the wives of Nanda Maharaja's brothers said, well, whose milk will you drink then? And Krishna said, I will drink fresh milk from the cows mixed with sugar. And then they said, the wives of his brothers who will you play with then? Krishna said, I will play with my father. I'll bring my brother also. And Nanda Maharaj said, will you not go to Rohini, your brother's mother? And Krishna angrily said with tears in his eyes, she left me and went away. Because he was calling for her when he was being tied but she didn't come. So then Rohini, Balaram's mother, with tears in her eyes, said softly, O oh son, why are you so harsh? Your mother is suffering. But not listening to her words, Krishna, with tearful eyes, glanced at his father's face. 
uh, Rohini gave a signal to Balaram. Balaram went to Krishna and held his hand, but Krishna rejected his hand and went to the lap of his father. So he's focusing on his on, on Nanda Maharaj. Then understanding the situation and that Krishna actually loves Mother Yashoda very much and he's just caught up in a mood under the circumstances. Nanda Maharaj says a very heavy thing, very heavy. He raises his hand as if he's going to hit someone and says, Oh, son, if you agree, I will beat her, which never in Vedic society, <laughs> never happens. But it's just Nanda Maharaj's strategy. So Krishna could not tolerate, tolerate this. He jumped up and stopped the hand of Nanda Maharaj. So understanding that actually Krishna had great affection for Mother Yashoda, then uh, Nanda Maharaj uh, said, if your mother's in this condition, what will you do? And then Krishna immediately became anxious for his mother and said, where is mother? I must go there. And then he went to Mother Yashoda. And Mother Yashoda kissed Krishna's head and made sounds like a cow. With a melted heart, she sobbed, making all others there sob. Hare Krishna. Shri Shri Yashoda Damada Ki Jai. Shri Shri Radha Damada Ki Jai. Go Premanandi. Now, I, I believe I was told that, that I should leave some minutes. There's 11 minutes left. Now, we could have gone on for a long time. But um, I was informed there may be some questions or comments. So I don't know quite how we take them. But here I am. I'm ready for some questions or comments if there are. Can anyone help me? If, if there are questions, where will I see them? Oh, look. Sexy Gopal Das. Thank you, Maharaj. Yes, there's uh, a comments box in the top right-hand corner. I uh, encourage all the viewers, if they have any questions, they can please uh, capture them Up on there. Facebook. And Maraj will be able to pick them up in the top right hand corner, Maraj, of your screen. There's a comments uh, tab. Okay. Well, there's the comments. There's, yeah, there's no I questions guess. at the moment. There's no um, questions. There's a few, quite a few comments. What so to do? Boys, feel, please feel free to add in your comments on YouTube or Facebook, and Maraj can answer them. Comments or questions? Yeah, we stopped early. Otherwise, I would have gone on. I mean, there's so much more that could have been said. Well, I tell you what. Let me do something more if there's not any questions or anything of that sort. Comments. I will read a verse. It is <laughs> sort of the, the uh, quintessential verse of this whole pastime. Oh, okay. So here's a question from Leah Rajesh. You mentioned that you're doing a seminar on this topic. Where can we hear that? Uh, you'd have to look on my Facebook page because it's all there. Yeah, and it's continuing. It's continuing. What will it be? 
on Saturday night will be the next thing, Saturday night, then Sunday, Sunday morning, Sunday evening. But you'd have to look on my Facebook page, Bhakti Chaitanya Swami. It's BCAIS official. Oh, there it is, look. Oh, okay, is that it? All right. I want to read this verse. This is like <clears throat> the essential verse of this pastime. It's uh, 10th Canto, chapter 9, verse 20. Neimam virincho na bavo, na shvirap yanga samshaya. Prasadam lebire gopi, yattat prapa vimukti dat. Translation. <clears throat> Neither Lord Brahma, nor Lord Shiva, nor even the goddess of fortune, who's always the better half of the Supreme Lord, can obtain from the Supreme Personality of Godhead the deliverer from this material world such mercy as received by Mother Yashoda. Yes, that's an important verse. And I'll tell you another thing. Here's another thing, <clears throat> which I would have explained at more length if we had more time. Uh, Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur explains that the pastimes described in Srimad Bhagavatam of Krishna killing demons in Vrindavan each demon and each pastime of killing a demon represents a particular anatha, some uh, unwanted thing, some obstacle, some difficulty which may arise in the life of a devotee. For example, Putana, the first demon is Putana. Putana she tried to disguise herself. She's actually like a monster, but she assumed the form of some very beautiful young, young lady, very pious looking, very sweet young lady. But actually she's like a monster. She's horrible. Really, absolutely disgusting. She represents the Anatha, of the pseudo-guru, the cheating guru. Now this pastime, and it's particularly the, the deliverance of Nalakuva and Mani Griva, but you know, it's, it's all part of one greater pastime. But that part, the deliverance of Nalakuva and Mani Griva, of course they were not killed, but they got Anyway, they, they got heavily chastised and they got mercy. So it represents, this is described by Bhaktivinoda Thakur, this pastime represents the pride and arrogance coming from the feeling that one has an aristocratic birth and is wealthy. It gives rise to cruelty to animals, lust for the opposite sex, and indulgence in alcohol. These further give rise to debauchery of the tongue, uncontrolled eating habits, and loose talking. Then come general hard-heartedness, shamelessness, and all sorts of disgraceful activities. Yeah. So you can you can see very easily, very clearly how Nala Kuvra Mani Griva, this is, you know, that was the state they were in. They, they were just degraded, shameless, just walking around naked, drinking liquor and just making absolute, not even idiots, just total reprobates of themselves in front of Narada Muni. Oh my gosh, how could you fall any lower? 
So, but it was all based on their aristocratic birth and wealth. They felt they felt those things were like a license to just do whatever they like, and they don't need to care about what anyone else thinks. Yeah, okay. So, so there you go. And and the antidote, the the cure for that unfortunate condition. Well, the cure is, as Narada Muni said, you could say effectively in, in our ISKCON terms, as Prabhupada described things, um, simple living and high thinking. Simple living and high thinking. This will cure someone who, you know, who, who has had such a birth and got some money uh, to bring them back down to ground, keep, get their feet back on the ground, and get them to focus in Krishna consciousness. The cure for that diseased condition, the cure is simple living and high thinking. Okay, devotees, Hare Krishna, thank you for the association. Have a nice Kartik, and we'll see you later. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai, Shri Shri Radha Damada Ki Jai, Shri Shri Yashoda Damada Ki Jai, Go Premanandi, Haribol.